Hey everybody, it's Nate from Explorers.life. I teach people how to build DIY campers. And in this video, I'm going to show you start to finish how I installed this complete DIY electrical system in this Mercedes Sprinter camper van. This video is going to cover building the wood frame, wiring the battery bank, the Lynx distributor, the chassis ground, the multi-plus inverter charger, the 120 volt AC distribution panel, the 12 volt DC distribution panel, shore power, solar charging, and alternator charging. And if at any point in time you want to jump straight to one of those sections, I put timestamps in the video timeline below so you can do just that. Now two things before we get started. First, there are a ton of other resources that accompany this video, like wiring diagrams, parts lists, plans, 3D models, and all kinds of other fun stuff that you'll probably want to check out, and those are in the video description. Now secondly, this video is also kicking off the brand new Explorus.life store, which features the wiring kits that you'll see in this video. Now if you've been around for a while, you've seen our parts list, and they were admittedly excessively long. And when pushing all of you guys to Amazon, we had no control over quality or them keeping items in stock. So Steph has been hard at work sourcing the parts and components required so that we could bring all of this in-house and make sourcing all of this stuff way less painful for all of us. Now, enough with the sales pitch. Let's get started. Every project should start with a plan. So the first step we did was to figure out exactly how much space we had to work with. We had a space that was about five feet long by two feet high with a wheel well right in the middle. And we wanted to make sure that this enclosure was as narrow as feasible. Now, you'll notice I had a level in there. Now, I wasn't using it as a level necessarily. Using a level in a van doesn't really work because the floor we're working off of is often unlevel and the van is pretty much guaranteed to be unlevel and the unlevelness of the van will change as more weight gets added to the van. I was only using the level as a straight edge here. Next, we took our measurements upstairs to my office and started modeling out all the details in SketchUp. I had a pretty good idea of what I wanted this to look like, but recently I've really enjoyed making these projects digitally so that I have a plan when it comes time to fasten the boards together. With a complete plan in SketchUp, now I know what size to cut the boards, how they'll attach together, and I can double check all my measurements ahead of time and export a cut list for the project so I can cut my plywood efficiently with minimal waste. Next, it was time to start cutting plywood. So I laid my piece of two inch foam board insulation on top of my workbench to act as a support for the board while using my circular saw. Now, if you've never used a piece of foam board like this to support your sheet goods while breaking it down into smaller pieces, you should really consider trying it because it really makes the process super easy. Now for this project, I'm using a five foot by five foot piece of three quarter inch Baltic birch plywood. Using my cut list I exported from the SketchUp file, I used my cordless circular saw with a straight edge guide to make all my initial cuts. And then once I had the plywood broken down into smaller, more manageable pieces, it was time to get the table saw set up for some more accurate cuts. Now I cut everything pretty much a quarter inch too big so that I could run it through the table saw to make the cuts just a bit more accurate, which is totally optional, but it's just something that I'm practicing with as I'm trying to get a bit better at woodworking. Next, I took the boards over to the miter saw to cut them to length. My boards were a bit too wide to cut them all the way through in one pass of the miter saw, so I had to set up a stop block, make the first cut, and then flip the board over to finish the cut. Now, a sliding miter saw would have fixed this problem, but alas, I don't have one. So this is how you tackle this issue if you're like me and you just have a standard miter saw. And lastly, I finished up a few of the smallest boards over on my crosscut sled on the table saw. Next up was running my sander over all of the boards. The boards were already pretty smooth, so a quick pass with some 280 grit sandpaper was sufficient for this project for now. Now that the boards were all cut apart, it was time to put them back together. Using the 3D model from the SketchUp file, I used tight bond wood glue on all the edges with a few one and a quarter inch brad nails with my nail gun to line everything up, and then finished the joint off with screws with the help of my Craig pocket hole jig. Once this structure was complete, I wanted to go ahead and mark where everything was going to go and pre-drill the pilot holes. Most of the components use either number 10 or number 14 screws, so I laid out all the components and made my way around the enclosure with an 8th inch bit and a 5/32ths inch bit, drilling my pilot holes as well as some of the bigger holes where the wires would need to go through the cabinet in a few strategic places. I wanted to clean up the wire holes with some grommets, so I grabbed the measurements for those and being impatient and not really wanting to wait a few days for shipping, I decided to just 3D print them. 
So a few minutes on SketchUp later, I had a 3D file, and then I let the 3D printer do some work printing the grommets while I went back downstairs to work on the next step. Now, although the edges of the Baltic birch were actually really pretty in my opinion, sometimes it does make it look unfinished when it's left like that. So Steph decided for me that we should finish off the edges with some edge banding. Now, if you've never heard of edge banding, it's simply a really thin piece of wood or veneer that has heat activated glue on the back of it. To install the edge banding, we literally just iron the edge banding into place. The iron melts the glue where it then seeps into the wood and the veneer, and then when it cools, it sets up nice and sturdy. The edge banding is a bit wider than the plywood, and they make an edge banding cutter, but I don't have one yet, and so I just use a wood file to take the edges down. A few quick strokes with, some, with the sanding sponge, and we were good to go, and the edge banding was all finished up. Now we put edge banding on all the exposed edges. The top edge is getting a lid, so we left that without the edge banding on purpose. Next, it was time to finish off the woodwork. So I gave one final sanding to knock down some of the scuffs and splinters it had after drilling the pilot holes from earlier, and then starting putting the finish on. For this project, I'm using Minwax Paste Finishing Wax, which pretty much just gets smeared on and then rubbed in with a rag. It's a little orange at first, but once it soaks in and dries, it's pretty much completely clear and doesn't really change the color of the wood at all. Leslie is planning on using Baltic birch countertops for this fan, so this enclosure would match the countertops when somebody opens the bench seat where this enclosure will live once the full build out is complete. Next up is making the battery tray and tie downs where the batteries will sit. I cut four pieces of one inch by one inch aluminum angle that would fit on all four sides of the battery bank. I used the miter saw for this piece with a two by four on top just to hold the angle in place nice and tight. Aluminum is a soft metal, so it's fine to cut with a standard wood blade. Just go slow, be careful, and wear eye protection, and keep your hands clear. Once the metal was cut, I drilled some holes with a countersink bit so the tops of the screws would sit nice and flush with the aluminum rails once installed. The piece of angle that was going to sit at the back of the battery bank was also going to hold down one side of the cam buckle lashing straps that I'm using to secure the batteries in place from the top. So after wrangling the loose straps, I secured the angle in place with some number 10 by 3 quarter inch wood screws with a screw through each of the strap. I put the batteries in place to get some accurate measurements, screwing the rails to the enclosure as I went. And then once I had a good measurement for how long the battery bank would physically be, I fastened the end rail and then secured the two strap tie downs just outside of the last rail for our battery straps. Then giving it a quick test and a teaser into the next chapter, I put all of the batteries into place and cinched the straps down to make sure everything fit as I wanted to and blessed it with a, that's not going anywhere. Now remember the grommets I printed earlier? Now it was time to go ahead and put those into place. A bit of super glue on the back of each one, put into the hole, and it was good to go. Now the flange on this particular grommet is much larger than the rest, and the only reason that I did that is because whenever I was drilling that hole, my hole saw tried to eat my hand, and it chewed up the wood in the process. Now I didn't want to waste time, and maybe more importantly wood, uh, so I simply decided to make the grommet trim just a bit bigger to cover up that happy little accident. And that's pretty much it. Here's a look at it before I get it in place into the van. I'm really happy with how it turned out, and I think it's going to make a great structure to hold all the electrical components that I'll be installing in this van going forward. The glue and pocket holes hidden on the backside make this structure incredibly strong and will have no problem withstanding the abuse of traveling down rough roads. And I'm especially happy with the straps and the battery tray as I've historically left the straps and stuff until the very end, which ended up being a bit of an afterthought. Building this into the initial design gives us a good plan for battery security from the very start. Next, I moved the enclosure into the van and slid it into place, and I'm really happy with how it turned out. I'm excited to start some of the actual electrical work on the enclosure. I slid the lid into place and secured the top with countersunk wood screws that can be easily removed for access to the batteries and the main system fuse as needed. Now that the enclosure is built, it's time to move on to the next step in the process, which is wiring the battery bank. And that's coming up next. Now that the frame is built, it's time to move on to wiring the battery bank. The parts used in this section of the build come from the Explorer Slife battery bank wiring kit, which includes everything you need to connect up to six batteries together using 4 out wire. It includes 5 foot of red 4 out wire, 5 foot of black 4 out wire, 20 4 out by 5 16 inch wire lugs, 10 pieces of black 1 inch heat shrink, and 10 pieces of red 1 inch heat shrink. I measured and cut 7 inch long pieces of wire from each 5 foot section, which is 5 pieces of each color, 
and this is a good length of wire to go from one 100 amp Battleborn battery to the next when they're positioned side by side. Now there's a bit of extra wire in the Explorus Life battery bank wiring kit for you if you're using different batteries or if you just need a bit more length for a different configuration. Next I use those same cutters to strip back 7 eighths of an inch of insulation from each end of the wire. And then I clamped my crimper to the table and I started crimping the 4 out by 5 16 inch wire lugs onto the ends of the wire. And now that the lugs were crimped to each end of the wire, nice and secure, it's time to finish off the wire with some adhesive line heat shrink. This heat shrink has a layer of heat activated glue that melts when it's heated up and seals off the connection from any kind of moisture, as well as adding a bit of additional strain relief to the lug. Now that the wires are all cut, stripped, crimped, and heat shrink together, it's time to move the batteries into place and wire them into a battery bank. I move the batteries into place in the battery tray of the enclosure and tighten down the strap to hold them nice and secure. Then I vacuumed out the dust and dirt that had accumulated near all the battery terminals of the batteries. Then I wiped all the battery terminals down with a bit of alcohol, which cleans off any grease, dirt, grime, anything like that that ends up on the terminals and gives a better electrical connection. And then I did the same thing with the wire lugs. This is also a good time to verify that there's no burrs or rough spots on the lugs and knock them down with a bit of sandpaper if needed. These particular lugs were all good to go, so a wipe down with some of the alcohol on a rag was all they needed. And finally, I bolted everything together with the bolts included with the Battleborn batteries. They include a stainless steel bolt with a nylock nut so it should never come loose. I worked my way down the line on both the positive and the negative terminals, putting the lugs, bolts, washers, and nuts in place. I only hand tightened everything initially and then came back with my impact driver and a wrench to snug everything up. Lastly, I made a pass with my torque wrench to get everything up to proper spec. Every battery manufacturer has its own recommendations on torque specs, but for Battleborn, it's 11 foot pounds. Now it's important to notice how I oriented the lugs onto the battery terminals. When a battery terminal gets two wire lugs on it, the lugs should go on the same side of the battery terminal. This is so that each battery can simply add power to the wires instead of having the full brunt of the power of the entire bank flowing through a battery terminal. Wiring it like this makes it less likely for heat to build up on a battery terminal as the biggest bulk of the power is flowing through the lugs and wires and not through the battery terminals. Now there are different ways to wire battery banks, but this method is the one that I find to be the easiest and uses the least amount of parts. This method is one of the four correct ways to wire a battery bank according to the Victron Wiring Unlimited book. Now that the batteries have been wired into a battery bank, it's time to move on down the line and wire the battery bank to the Lynx distributor, and that's coming up next. Now that the battery bank is wired, it's time to connect that to the Victron Lynx distributor. Here's a list of the components used in this section of the build. The Victron Lynx distributor and the Explorus Life Lynx distributor wiring kit, which includes the Victron BMV712 battery monitor wire, wire lugs, heat shrink, an ANL fuse and fuse holder, links adapters, a master battery disconnect, shunt and switch spacers, a butt splice connector, and some assorted screws and hardware. The first step is going to be mounting the shunt, so I grabbed the Victron BMV712 battery monitor box. I thoroughly read through the instruction manual so I fully understood how this thing worked, and then I grabbed the shunt. I also grabbed the shunt spacers and screws from the Explorus Life Lynx distributor wiring kit. I already had the shunt positioning pre-laid out like I showed in the enclosure build part of this series, so mounting the shunt was simply a matter of screwing the shunt to the wall with the spacers in between. Now this was just temporarily mounted for the sake of taking a measurement for now. I took a measurement for the negative wire that will go from the shunt to the battery bank. Now, wires exiting the battery bank should be on opposite ends of the battery bank, so I stretched this wire to the furthest battery in the bank, made my mark, and then moved over to the workbench to cut, strip, crimp, and heat shrink a 4 aught by 5 16 inch wire lug onto the end that would attach to the battery bank, and a 4 aught by 3 8 inch wire lug onto the end that would attach to the shunt. Next was moving on to the positive wire that goes from the battery bank to the Lynx distributor. Now, before the positive wire gets to the Lynx distributor, it has to go through the main system fuse, as well as the main battery cutoff switch. So, I started measuring, cutting, crimping, and heat shrinking lugs onto the 4-aught wire. 
the battery and fuse connections get a 4 aught by 5 16 inch wire lug, and the battery shutoff switch gets a 4 aught by 3 8 inch lug. Now, if you've got a sharp eye, you'll notice that I'm installing a battery switch rated to 300 amps continuous and a 400 amp ANL fuse. Now, this is fine because ABYC standards allow us to use a fuse size that's up to 150% of the max rated ampacity of the wire, and the switch falls into the same category. 150% of 300 amps for the switch is 450 amps, so our 300 amp continuous switch is within ABYC parameters for a 400 amp fuse. The switch is sized based on the actual load that we anticipate pushing through it. The MultiPlus 3K that we'll be installing in this system will pull no more than 250 amps through this switch, and that is running pedal to the metal and the thing to the floor, which will rarely happen. That gives us an additional 50 amps for 12 volt DC appliances, which we will never do under continuous usage. Now, if you plan to run your 3000 watt inverter at max capacity continuously and use more than 50 amps DC power continuously all at the same time, you're probably gonna want a bigger switch with a higher rated current. But in all honesty, you're probably going to want a bigger system than this anyway if your electrical demands are that high. Now you'll also notice that I made the linear distance from each end of both of these wire runs identical, taking the fuse, switch, and shunt links into account. Now this is important so that the battery bank drains and charges evenly, since each wire will have as close to identical resistance as we can possibly get, or at least how that's how it's going to work on paper. Now let's put all this stuff together. I wiped all the wire lugs down with some alcohol on a rag to clean them off and started mounting components and making connections. Negative wire to shunt, links adapter to shunt, and shunt to wall. Remembering to put the shunt spacers between the shunt and the wall. Also, notice the direction of the shunt here. There's a battery side of the shunt and a loads and chargers side of the shunt. So the direction this is installed does indeed matter. And then the positive wire to the switch, the links adapter to the switch, and the switch to the wall. Now there are spacers for the battery switch in the Explorus Life Lynx distributor wiring kit that go between the switch and the wall. The input versus output markings on the back of the switch, they don't matter. In fact, the input versus output will actually change depending on if the batteries are charging or if they're discharging. Next, I lined up the Lynx distributor and screwed it to the wall. Then I fastened both the Lynx adapters from the switch and the shunt to the Lynx distributor in a bolt, washer, Lynx adapter, Lynx distributor, washer, lock washer, nut kind of fashion. Then I connected the wire from the switch to the fuse holder, and then I screwed the fuse holder to the wall. And then I connected the wire from the fuse holder to the battery bank, looping the excess down between the battery and the enclosure. Now I would have loved to have cleaned up that loop and made it shorter, but like I mentioned earlier, keeping the positive and negative wires the same length means that there had to be excess wire somewhere, which was unavoidable, but it's electrically correct, so I'm obviously fine with it. And then after that, I connected the negative wire from the shunt to the battery bank, and I saved this to the end just so the wire was out of the way while I was trying to mount the fuse holder and such. And then I moved on to the power wire to connect to the shunt. This little power wire powers the little computer board on the side of the shunt for the BMV712 that also sends power to the display gauge. I connected this wire to the furthest stud on the right of the Lynx distributor, and this means that power to the BMV712 will be disconnected when the main system switch is turned off. Now, if you want the BMV712 to stay on all of the time, you would want to connect this wire somewhere on the battery side of the switch. Now, this is personal preference. There's really no wrong answer here. I like to be able to turn off the whole entire system with no loads running for the sake of system storage, and that's why I personally like it like this. Now the power wire that's included with the BMV712 is way too long for our purposes, so we added a butt splice connector to the Explorus Life Lynx distributor wiring kit so that we could just cut the wire down to make a more appropriate length. And to do that, I just cut the wire after the fuse, stripped each end of the wire back a bit, crimped each side of the splice connector, and then melted the adhesive lined heat shrink and then plugged the ferrule into the B1 terminal on the shunt. The data cable for the BMV712 was already run through the walls, so I just grabbed one end and connected it to the shunt. Then I moved up to the gauge, where I drilled a hole with my 2 and an eighth inch hole saw and mounted the gauge into the hole. The other end of the data cable that we just plugged into the shunt goes into the back of the gauge, like so. Lastly, I bolted the main fuse in place and turned on the master switch. And we have power. Now it was time to open up the Victron Connect app, update the firmware, 
and change the parameters to match our system, which I'll leave a cheat sheet to that um, in a blog post that accompanies this video. You can find a link to that blog post in the video description below this video. And then finally, I put some zip ties and cable clamps on the cables for some cable management and put the covers for the various components back into place. Now that this step in the project is all finished up, it's time to move on to the next step, which is connecting the chassis ground from the body of the van to the Lynx distributor, and that's coming up next. Now that the battery bank is wired to the Lynx distributor, it's time to wire the chassis ground. For this section of the install, I'm using the Explorus Live chassis ground wiring kit, which includes some wire, wire lugs, heat shrink, a bolt, a nut, washers, a lock washer, and a serrated washer. Now I'm actually going to show you two ways to make this connection because the van that I'm actually working on here has a pretty specific best way to connect the chassis ground, but it's not particularly common, so I don't know how useful that will be. So I'm going to cover the more common way with a bench top demonstration here. Now pretend this piece of metal is a body support rib. Typically I would drill a hole into any of the body support ribs or any other solidly attached piece of metal with a 5 16 inch drill bit. And then I would put a washer onto a bolt and then I would put that through the wire lug and then I would put the serrated washer on the bolt and then I would put the bolt through the body support rib. And then on the other side I'd put a washer, a lock washer, and a nut and then tighten all of that up. The serrated washer would cut through any paint into the metal, giving us a good grounding connection. Now, depending on which code or standard you're looking at, this serrated washer is either adequate or inadequate for making the grounding connection. So the other alternative would be to scrape the paint down to bare metal and apply the wire lug directly to the metal with no serrated washer. So do with that information what you will. You now have options for if you're trying to mirror this install. Now, the walls of this van are already installed, and I didn't want to take them down just to get to a body support rib, but there was a plus nut right there, so I'm using that. Now, unfortunately, it was inset into the hole a bit, which meant that I had to modify a wire lug to fit. Now, normally, I don't like bending wire lugs, but since it's just for a chassis ground wire and not an actual power wire, I'm fine with it. A bench vise and a stout screwdriver, and we had a wire lug that would indeed fit. I crimped that lug onto a 4 out wire and secured it in place with a washer, a lock washer, and a bolt. And then I slid the frame back into place and bent the wire up and around and connected it to the front of the Lynx adapter where it connects to the negative bus bar of the Lynx distributor. Now this wire has to be so thick because ABYC says that the chassis ground wire can be no smaller than one size smaller than the biggest wire in the system. And since we're using 4 aught wire for our other connections, that means that this wire could be no smaller than 3 aught. But for the sake of consolidating wire sizes and lugs, we opted for 4 aught here. This large of a wire is so that if there's a direct short with the chassis, there's a return loop back to the battery bank rated to the full ampacity of the current carrying conductors in the system so that the circuit could complete and the main fuse would blow, thus protecting the system. Now that this step in the project is all finished up, it's time to move on to the next step, which is connecting the Victron Multi Plus Inverter Charger to the Lynx Distributor, and that's coming up next. Now that we've wired the chassis ground, it's time to wire the Victron Multi Plus Inverter Charger to the Victron Lynx Distributor. Here's a list of the bits and pieces used in this part of the install. The Victron Multi Plus 3K Inverter Charger and the Explorers Life 3K Multi Plus Wiring Kit, which includes 4 out red wire, 4 out black wire, wire lugs, heat shrink, a 400 amp mega fuse, the VE bus smart dongle, an RJ45 UTP data cable, and some mounting screws and hardware. The first thing to do was to mount the MultiPlus inverter charger, which comes with a backer plate for hanging. I used five wood screws from the Explorers Life MultiPlus wiring kit to mount this hanger plate to my frame. And then I hung the MultiPlus on the hanger plate. And then after that, I secured the bottom of the MultiPlus with two pan head screws into the bottom of the MultiPlus. Next, I turned off the master battery switch and removed the cover of the MultiPlus and the Lynx distributor. And then I got busy cutting, stripping, crimping, and heat shrinking the big 4 out wires that would go from the Lynx distributor to the MultiPlus. There was a positive wire, a negative wire, and an equipment ground wire, all of which got 4 out by 5 16 inch wire lugs. I wiped down all the electrical lugs with some alcohol to clean them off so that they make some good electrical connections. And then I took the nuts, washers, and lock washers off of the Victron Lynx distributor and pulled off these little separator flaps just to get them out of the way. They simply snap in and out of place. 
Next, I'm making my MultiPlus equipment ground connection. This one goes to the center stud of the negative bus bar in the Victron Links distributor. The other side goes to the little equipment ground stud on the bottom of the MultiPlus inverter charger with the order going MultiPlus, serrated washer, wire lug, washer, lock washer, and nut, and then tighten it all up. Next was the negative connection going to the MultiPlus. I put that on the far left stud of the negative bus bar inside of the Victron Links distributor and tightened down the hardware. And then I cleaned off my 400 amp fuse and put it into place on the positive bus bar. And then I put the positive wire lug in place and then tightened down the washer, lock washer, and nut on both the top and bottoms of the mega fuse to their proper torque. And after that, I connected the positive wire to the positive terminal on the MultiPlus. And then I fought with the negative wire for a minute and finally got it into position and tightened down. Hindsight being 2020, I think it would have been easier to wire the MultiPlus side of these wires first. But it doesn't really matter electrically. Do with that information what you will. Next, I'm going to wire the VE Bus smart dongle so that we can Bluetooth into the MultiPlus and turn the unit on and off from our phone and set the proper shore power input current limits. Using a tiny screwdriver, I connected the red wire ferrule to the battery positive terminal and the black wire ferrule to the battery negative terminal of the VE Bus smart dongle. And then I connected the positive wire lug to the positive terminal of the Victron MultiPlus and then connected the negative wire lug to the negative terminal of the MultiPlus. Then I plugged one side of the RJ45 UTP cable into the VE Bus Smart dongle, and then I cleaned off a smut underneath the MultiPlus with some alcohol, pulled off the double-sided tape cover, and then stuck the VE Bus Smart dongle into place just right underneath the MultiPlus. And then I ran that RJ45 UTP cable up into the MultiPlus and plugged it into one of the VE bus ports on the far left side. And it doesn't really matter which one you use, they'll both work just fine. Now with all cables in their proper places, with positive wires connected to positive terminals and negative wires connected to negative terminals, I could turn on the main battery switch, which would deliver 12 volt DC power to the MultiPlus. And then I could turn the MultiPlus switch up to on, and then I could hear the MultiPlus click on and then use my multimeter to see that I did indeed have about 120 volts between the hot and neutral AC output number one terminals. And then I could open up my Victron Connect app, click on the VE Bus Smart device, which is the MultiPlus, update the firmware as necessary, and then see that we are connected and that the inverter is indeed inverting 12 volt DC power to 120 volt AC power as intended. Nice. We could use the app to then turn the MultiPlus off and then back on, as well as set our input current limit. Now the input current limit is simply telling the MultiPlus what amperage of shore power that you're connected to so that the MultiPlus knows not to pull any more power than that preset amount so that you'll never accidentally trip the shore power breaker and the MultiPlus will pull any overages from the battery bank. This is called power assist and I'm going to explain that more in depth in an upcoming how this system works section of this installation series. Now, if you actually need to program your MultiPlus, you'll want to use the Victron MK3 USB dongle and then run a wired USB connection to a laptop or an Android phone through an on-the-go cable to the VE bus connection on the MultiPlus and then open the Victron Connect app. Changing the settings in the Victron Connect app for the MultiPlus is reserved for Victron trained professionals only. So there is a password for this section and the password for trained professionals is ZZZ, but if you aren't a trained professional, you can't use that password. You just can't. Do with that information what you will. But since I'm a trained Victron professional, I can show you that this gets you into the extensive Victron Multi Plus programming options. Now, we aren't going to dive into this in this video because this MultiPlus was purchased from Battleborn, and when you purchase batteries and a MultiPlus from Battleborn, it gets pre programmed for you, so you don't have to mess with any of this stuff. So, since all of this is pre programmed for us, we are good to go. And now we're all wrapped up. The MultiPlus is now connected to the Lynx distributor, and the VE Bus smart dongle is connected to the MultiPlus. Now it's time to make it so that we can use some of this power by connecting the MultiPlus to the 120 volt AC distribution panel. And that's the next step in this series, so stay tuned. Now that we wired the Victron MultiPlus inverter charger to the Lynx distributor, it's time to wire the MultiPlus to the 120 volt distribution panel. 
Here is a list of the components used in this section of the build, the 120 volt AC distribution panel and the Explorus Life 120 volt AC distribution panel wiring kit, which includes six gauge triplex wire, six gauge insulated ferrules, a 50 amp main breaker, a wire gland, and the screws to mount the panel. Now before I got started, I checked to verify that my battery disconnect switch was off. And I also checked with my voltage sensor that I had no 120 volt power coming out of my MultiPlus and it was safe to work on. The first thing to do was to prep the 6.3 wire. I stripped four inches of the outer sheath off. And then I put some one inch black heat shrink around the cut to clean up the edge and add a bit of extra protection. And then I took the wire gland from the MultiPlus and slid the wire gland into place with the help of a drop or two of Dawn soap and tightened down the gland. And yes, this entry gland is too small for 6.3 wire. Victron knows how big of a pain this is and has it penciled in in the next revision of the MultiPlus to fix this. But until then, this is our solution. Next up, I put the three wires into my table vise with the white wire in the middle. Now this is helpful because it holds the wires flat across for easy measuring since we're trying to put these wires from a round sheath into wire terminals that are flat across inside of the MultiPlus. Then I measured out and stripped back about 5 eighths of an inch from each wire. And then I crimped a 6 gauge insulated ferrule onto each one. Next, with ample amounts of wiggling and a modest amount of cussing, I use my needle nose pliers to help guide the three wires into place. Black, white, and green to the line, neutral, and ground terminals respectively. Once they were fully seated, I tightened up the screw terminals to their proper torque specifications and then tightened up the wire gland on the bottom of the MultiPlus. Tighten it with your fingers the best you can and then a flathead screwdriver helps get it just a bit tighter. Just be careful, don't stab yourself. Actually, for liability reasons, I don't recommend you doing this. Just This is just what I did. Next, I secured the wire up and out of the way along the upper back corner of the box. Now after that, it was time to open up the AC distribution box and cut away the hole for the wire gland and fasten the wire gland into place. And this one is one we specifically chose for the Explorus Life 120 volt AC distribution wiring kit so we could make 100% sure that it fit. I stripped back the sheathing on the 6.3 wire and put it into place inside of the wire gland. Next, I fed the five 120 volt branch circuits into the distribution box. And then I screwed the box to the wall. Next, it was time to wire up all of the wires inside of the 120 volt AC distribution box. So I started with stripping back the insulation on each of the triplex wires. I took a picture of these circuits before I cut off the sheathing so that I could remember which was which when it came time to label the circuits on the panel. The first thing here was snapping the breakers into place. There's a little notch on the bottom of the breaker that just sits on the lip in the middle of the panel and then tilts up into place with the positive bus bar going into the slot on the back of the breaker. This breaker box has two sides. We're only using one side in this application. With the tandem breakers I'm using, we can actually get eight different circuits on this one side, which should be plenty for any camper van. The other side is reserved for campers with 50 amp shore power service with two hot legs incoming or for powering circuits from the MultiPlus AC out 2, which is for circuits only powered when shore power is connected. Now I put a few use case scenarios for the two sides of this distribution panel on the product page for this distribution panel to help clear this up. After that, I simply started working my way down the circuits, putting a ferrule on each one and then inserting the green wires into the ground bus bar at the back and the white ones into the neutral bus bar at the front. I recommend doing all the green ones first and then doing the white ones. It just helps keep things organized. And finally, the black wires go up into their respective breakers. The six gauge goes into the 50 amp main breaker in and the power goes out to all of the 120 volt branch circuits through each of the 20 amp tandem breakers and the 12 gauge triplex wires that was already run in this van. And here's how a look at the panel looks all wired up. Now I can screw the lid to the panel and then print off some labels with my label maker and put those into their respective slots on the front of the panel. Next, I can turn all the breakers on, turn the main battery switch on, and then turn the MultiPlus on. And we have power. That's always a good feeling. Now that we have power to all of our 120 volt branch circuits throughout the 120 volt distribution panel, Let's keep going with this theme of 120 volt power and connect our shore power. And that's coming up in the next section of this series, so stay tuned.
Now that we've wired the 120 volt distribution panel, it's time to wire for shore power. All of the components in this section of the build are part of the Explorus Life 30 amp shore power wiring kit, which include 10 gauge triplex wire, 10 gauge insulated ferrules, a 30 amp shore power inlet, and a 30 amp shore power cord. The first thing to do was to wire the 10 gauge triplex wire to the back of the shore power inlet. I loosened the strain relief bar and then fed the 10 gauge triplex wire up through the back. Then I stripped off about three inches of the outer sheathing of the wire and then stripped back about five eighths of an inch off of each wire and inserted those into their respective slots on the back of the shore power inlet. They are color coded so the black wire goes to the black terminal, green wire to the green terminal, and white wire to the white terminal. Now I didn't use ferrules on these connections because the insulated ferrules like I like to use inside of enclosures, they just wouldn't fit into the bottom of the terminal here. So I opted for bare wire. The terminals are far enough apart that the chances of stray wires going from one side to the other causing a short is pretty much slim to none. Remember, ferrules are a tool and not a requirement. If they're hindering more than they're helping, they don't have to be used. Next, I slid the back of the inlet up the wire and tightened the strain relief bar in place. Now, I'm going to do a tabletop demonstration here of how to install the shore power inlet because the shore power inlet on this van was pre-installed. So, pretend this piece of sheet metal is the side of the van. I taped off the side of the van directly where I was drilling to keep any stray metal shavings away. And then I drilled through the metal with my hole saw. And then I used my deburring tool to remove any shrapnel that was left over. And then I slid my shore power inlet in place and drove some self-tapping screws into place. Now, I wasn't really securing the inlet with the self-tapping screws as I don't feel like that's strong enough. Um, so I was only using these screws to pre-drill the holes for some bolts that I'll install in just a second. I pulled the inlet out and made one more pass with my deburring tool. And then I masked off the back side with some tape. And then to keep the raw edges from rusting, I went over it with a quick shot of spray paint to coat the exposed metal. And then I reinstalled the shore power inlet using number six stainless steel machine screws, washers, and lock washers to hold the inlet firmly in place. Now the inlet comes with a gasket pre-installed, but if you're worried about water intrusion, feel free to use a small eighth inch bead of butyl tape around the outside of the inlet to seal everything up nice and tight. Now moving to the other end of the wire, now the wire that's actually being connected to the permanent shore power connection that's already on the van. I stripped back about three inches of the outer sheathing of the 10 gauge triplex wire, and then I stripped back about a half inch from each of the 10 gauge wires inside. And then I crimped a ferrule onto each wire. And then I used a pair of needle nose pliers to guide each wire into their respective spot. Black, white, and green for line, neutral, and ground. And then I tightened up these terminals and the wire gland. And that pretty much wraps up this project. Now to make sure all was good to go, I turned the battery switch on, plugged the system into one of my outlets here in my shop, opened up the Victron Connect app, turned the MultiPlus on, and saw the MultiPlus start charging. And I also saw a charge through my BMV712. This means that shore power is charging my batteries, and if I connected a 120 volt load inside the van, the shore power would start powering that load, and whatever was left over would go on to charge the batteries. Now that we can power our 120 volt loads directly from shore power and charge our 12 volt DC battery bank from 120 volt shore power, it's time to move on to the next part of this series, which is wiring up our 12 volt fuse block. And that's coming up next. Now that we've wired for shore power, it's time to wire the Lynx distributor to the 12 volt distribution panel. Here's a list of the components used in this section of the build. The 12 volt distribution panel and the Explorus Life 12 volt distribution panel wiring kit which includes six gauge wire, wire lugs, heat shrink, ferrules, a 100 amp fuse, and the screws to mount the panel to the wall. The first step was to measure, cut, strip, crimp, and heat shrink the wires that go from the Lynx distributor to the 12 volt distribution panel. Both the positive and negative wires have a six gauge by 5 16 inch wire lug on one side and a ferrule on the other side. Next up was connecting the positive and negative wires to the positive and negative bus bars inside of the Victron Lynx distributor. 
I wipe down each wire lug with a bit of alcohol to clean the connector to make a better electrical connection. And then I put the negative wire on the negative bus bar in the Victron Lynx distributor and replace the washer, lock washer, and nut. And then I tightened it to the recommended torque. And then I placed the 100 amp fuse into place along with the positive wire and then tightened the hardware up to the recommended torque. Then I stretched those two wires over to the 12 volt fuse block and started wiring the 12 volt branch circuits. I stripped back about eight inches of the outer sheath of each of the wires and then connected the negative wires to the negative bus bar on the back of the DC distribution panel. And then the positive wires go to the positive terminals. Now each positive wire gets its own terminal, but the negative wires can share spots on the bus bar if needed. Now, if you need help on what sizes of wires and fuses to use for all your 12 volt branch circuits, I have a 12 volt branch circuit guidebook that might be helpful and I'll leave a link to that in the video description below. I chose not to use ferrules for these branch circuits because I felt like it added a bit too much bulk. Remember, ferrules are a tool and not a requirement. If they're hindering more than they're helping, they don't have to be used. Lastly, I connected the positive and negative wires from the Lynx distributor to their respective spots in the 12 volt fuse block. Negative wire to the negative bus bar and the positive wire to the positive terminal at the bottom. Once that was all wired together, I put the blade fuses into their appropriate spots in the front of the 12 volt distribution panel. And then I got to work printing off some labels for the circuits with my label maker. And then finished it all up by screwing the panel to the wall. Next was time to test the circuits. So I turned on the main battery switch and then I pushed the button for the lights and the lights came on. Awesome. Now we have powered all of our 12 volt DC circuits. The next step of this process is to install the entire solar charging leg of the system. And this is gonna be a good one, so stay tuned. It's coming up next. Now that we have wired the 12 volt distribution panel, it's time to wire the system for solar charging. Here is a list of the main components used in this section of the build. The 400 watt Solaria solar panel, the Victron Smart Solar MPPT-130 solar charge controller, and the Explorus Life MPPT-130 wiring kit, which includes wire, ferrules, wire lugs, heat shrink, and a fuse. And we also use the Explorus Life solar array wiring kit, which includes wire, MC4 connectors, a solar isolator with wire glands, a roof entry gland, a wire grommet, ferrules, and heat shrink. The first step was to measure, cut, strip, crimp, and heat shrink the lugs and ferrules onto the wires that connect the charge controller output and the equipment ground. There's a 5 16 inch wire lug and a ferrule on the power wires and two wire lugs on the equipment ground wires, a quarter inch wire lug on one side and a 5 16 inch wire lug on the other. Next, I'm going to secure the quarter inch wire lug to the equipment ground stud on the side of the charge controller with the serrated washer between the lug and the controller, and then the washer, lock washer, and screw on top. Then I'm gonna fasten the charge controller to the wall with my four 14 by three quarter inch pan head screws. After that, I cleaned off the lugs and ferrules with some alcohol to make a better electrical connection and then connected the negative wire to the negative bus bar inside of the Lynx distributor. And then I put my mega fuse in place. And then I placed the positive wire on the fuse and tightened the nuts to the Victron recommended torque. And after that, I connected the positive and negative ferrules to the positive and negative battery terminals on the bottom of the smart solar charge controller and tightened those down. And after a bit of wire management, it was time to move on to the other end of the equipment ground wire. The charge controller equipment ground wire just needs to be connected somewhere where it has a clear path back to the negative bus bar in the Lynx distributor. Since all the spots on the Lynx distributor are taken, I find it best to connect it to the equipment ground stud on the MultiPlus. I removed the nut washer and lock washer, put the wire lug in place, and then replaced the washer, lock washer, and nut and then tightened it all down. Now that the charge controller was connected to the Lynx distributor, now is a good time to go ahead and program it. I turned on the battery disconnect switch, opened my Victron Connect app, clicked on my charge controller, and then went through all the settings and changed them to the recommended parameters for these Battleborn batteries. 
Now, I'll leave a cheat sheet for the settings in the blog post that accompanies this video. Now that the settings were set, I can turn the battery disconnect back off. And now it's time to move on to wiring the solar isolator. I used a flathead screwdriver to remove the bottom two plugs on the isolator. And then I inserted the wire glands into those holes. Now, the glands are a bit tight getting started, but they do indeed fit. A bit of persistence pays off here. Now there are four of these wire glands included with the Explorus Life Solar Wiring Kit because the isolator can actually handle two separate solar arrays at the same time. But if you're only using one solar array, you'll just have an extra two wire glands left over. With that all assembled, I fastened the isolator to the wall. And next up is connecting the wires that come from the roof and go out to the PV side of the charge controller. Each of these terminals on this isolator just goes straight through. So if you line up the positive and the positive and the negative and the negative, the power will just pass straight through properly. Now, I didn't use ferrules on these connections because the insulated ferrules that I like to use inside of enclosures wouldn't fit under the bottom of the terminal. So I opted for bare wire here. Now the terminals are far enough apart that the chances of stray wires going from one side to the other causing a short is slim to none. Remember, ferrules are a tool and not a requirement. If they're hindering more than they're helping, they don't have to be used. Now that the isolator was all wired up, I put the cover on the isolator and then connected the PV wires running from the isolator to the PV side of the charge controller. Red wire to the positive terminal and black wire to the negative terminal. And after a liberal application of zip ties for some wire management, it was time to move up to the roof and install the roof entry gland. I chose a good spot for the roof entry gland and then drilled a tiny hole to mark where it was going to go. I used the smallest drill bit I had so that I didn't make a bunch of metal shavings. The few metal shavings that it did make were vacuumed up immediately, but using only a 1 16th inch drill bit, there wasn't much material removed. And then I taped a box to the bottom of the ceiling to catch any metal that falls down while I'm making my bigger hole from up on top of the roof. Then I thoroughly cleaned off the area around where the roof entry gland was going to be installed and marked out exactly where I wanted the wire grommet and roof entry gland to go. Next I cut a hole in a box and then I taped it down around where I was drilling the hole for the wire grommet to catch all the metal shavings that I was about to make. I started the hole with a standard 5 16 inch drill bit and then I used a step bit to drill it out further to 1 inch across. And then I vacuumed up the metal shavings out of the box. And then I used my deburring tool to remove the sharp edges and sharp burrs from the hole. And then I did the same thing from the underside and then decided it would be a fantastic idea to test for additional burrs with my finger and promptly sliced it open. After tending to that, I taped the bottom of the hole up and came back up top for one more cleaning. And then a quick squirt of paint to keep the raw edges from rusting and it was time to install the cable grommet. Now, sorry for the lack of camera focus here, but I carefully poked a hole into the cable grommet with a pair of scissors. And then squeezed the cable grommet into place in the hole I just drilled. Now this grommet will keep the solar wires from getting cut on the metal that is, as I found out the hard way, really sharp. Next, I put some 3M double-sided VHB tape on the back of the roof entry gland. Trimmed off the excess on the outside and fed the wires up through the hole and through the roof entry gland. And pushed the roof entry gland down into place on the rooftop. Next, I taped off about three quarters of an inch around the outside of the roof entry gland and used some Sikaflex sealant all around the outside of the edges of the roof entry gland, up on the flange of the roof entry gland, and out to the tape line. Now I wanted to try to smooth out the sealant a little bit, so I used a trick that Stephanie found out in a house remodel we did last year. I sprayed the wet sealant and my fingers with a bit of water with a drop or two of Dawn soap in it, and then I worked my way around, just smoothing the sealant out. The soapy water keeps the sealant from sticking to my fingers, so it just lays down nicely. Now since the sealant is obviously hydrophobic, the water doesn't soak down into the sealant. Now it works well for caulk, and after letting it dry overnight, it seems like it worked just as well here, but if you're trying to mirror this project, use your own discretion, as this is probably against manufacturer's recommendations. Peeling up the tape pretty much immediately after gives me a nice clean line. Now, don't be shy with this stuff. It's hidden from view underneath the solar panel once installed, and it's really, really important to make sure that this gets full coverage so you don't end up with a roof leak. 
Finishing off the roof duties for now meant crimping on an MC4 connector onto the wires coming out of the roof that go down to the solar isolator. The solar array wiring was pretty straightforward since we only had one panel here, so it was only one set of MC4 connectors that needed to be crimped. Next up was mounting the solar panel brackets to the solar panel. We laid the solar panel face down on the work table on a moving blanket to keep the solar panel from scratching my workbench. And then we marked the front and the back on the back of the solar panel because I'm easily confused. And then I measured out where all the brackets should be mounted and drilled the holes into the frame of the solar panel. Now when I drilled the holes for these brackets, I put a piece of 1x4, just scrap piece I had laying around, uh, right behind the solar panel frame because the aluminum frame likes to grab the bit and pull it through pretty aggressively if you're not paying attention. So going slow is key and also having a piece of wood to act as a buffer so you don't drill through the glass of your solar panel is also a good safety net. Lastly, I bolted the mounting brackets to the solar panel with the supplied hardware. Now I'll leave a link to these specific brackets in the video description below because they are a pretty good solution for mounting solar panels to these OEM sprinter roof rails when you're not using a roof rack or anything like that. Next up was me standing around for 10 minutes or so trying to figure out how I was going to get the panel on the roof, but ultimately just decided to try to lift it overhead by myself. And success! So knowing that I could get the panel overhead, I had Steph come down for a nice game of charades. We tilted the panel up on edge, I climbed onto my work table, hoisted the panel overhead, and then we just slid the panel forward on the roof rails, being careful not to let the mounting feet touch the paint. Having Stephanie on a ladder off to the side to guide the feet on the rails was pretty helpful here. Next up was connecting the solar panel wires to the wires that we just installed through the roof entry gland and securing the solar panel wires to the frame of the solar panel with zip ties. And after the wire was cleaned up nice and neat, I made my way around the solar panel, attaching the solar panel mounting feet to the roof rail mounting plates with the included hardware. And that's it. Now I could turn the battery switch to on, and then the solar array isolator switch to on. Then I could pull the van out into the sun. And I could check out the Victron Connect app, click on the charge controller side of things, and then see that I am indeed charging. Now, if you don't see a charge here, there could be something wrong, sure, but more often than not, it simply means that your batteries are full. And if your batteries are full, your solar panels won't charge until the batteries drain a little bit. So, that's all there is to it. Now we have a solar charging source for our house battery bank in this camper van. And now it's time to add the final charging source to this system, which is charging from the alternator. And that's coming up next. Now that we have wired for solar charging, it's time to wire for alternator charging. Here is a list of the components used in this section of the build. The Victron Orion 121230 DC to DC charger and the Explorus Life Orion DC to DC charger wiring kit, which includes wire, lugs, heat shrink, ferrules, fuses, and some hardware to screw the Orion to the box. First, I'm going to make sure that my solar disconnect switch is off and my battery disconnect switch is off. And then I'm going to get the Orion out of the box and screw it to the wall. Next, I'm going to tape this little green remote bridge that's in the box to the front of the Orion. So I won't forget to put it in place later because this Orion will not function without it. Next, I'm going to measure, cut, strip, crimp, and heat shrink the lugs and ferrules into the positive and negative wires that goes from the Orion to the Lynx distributor. Then I'm going to wipe down all my connections with some alcohol to clean them off to make a good electrical connection. And then I'm going to put the wire lug for the negative wire onto the negative bus bar of the Lynx distributor and tighten it down. And then I'm going to slide the mega fuse into place and then the positive wire onto the fuse, and then tighten both of those nuts down. Next, I can connect the wires to the Orion. The wires we just hooked to the Lynx distributor get connected to the Orion output positive and negative, red and black respectively. And the red and black wires going to the front of the van under the driver's seat go to the positive and negative input terminals on the Orion. Put those in place and tighten those down. 
And now after a few cable clamps and it's time to move up to the front underneath the steering wheel. I removed the door to the battery negative connection that is behind the dash so that our seat belt light doesn't give us problems when we remove the seat. This door just snaps out of place. Pulling it towards me and then tilting it forward uh, toward the front of the van seemed to work the best here. Then I pushed the button on the top of the battery negative clippy thing here and then pulled it off of the chassis ground stud and just set it to the side. Next I removed the wire that connects to the driver's seat by squeezing the tabs on each side. And after that I removed the four bolts that hold the driver's seat to the pedestal and pulled the seat out of the van and set it aside. Next was time to make access to the fuse holder and ground stud in the bottom of the seat pedestal. Now, this looks pretty intimidating, but it's not too bad for someone with average mechanical aptitude. I'm also not going to pretend like I know what all this stuff is called, and that's fine. We don't need to know what it's called. We just need it out of the way. So, I unclipped this box and moved it to the side. And then I undid the two nuts at the top right and top left, so I could get all of this fancy computer stuff up and out of the way. And there is where I'm connecting the negative wire. So I undid that nut, put my wire lug for the negative wire going back to the Orion on top, and then retighten the nut. Now the negative connection is done. I unscrewed the two screws on either side of this relay rail and moved it to the side. And then I moved to the side of the pedestal to unscrew all six screws holding the fuse blocks to the side of the pedestal. And then I pulled those up and out of the way and secured all of that madness with a strap. From there, I unbolted the four power wires connecting to the fuse holder that I'm trying to access. Once I had those wires free, I could squeeze the retention tabs on the fuse holder to slide the fuse holder away from me and then up and out of the bottom of the seat. Next, I took the fuse holder over to my workbench and used a pair of prying tools to work my way around the outside of the fuse block, working the clips free. And I think I only broke one clip, which is a record for me, so I'll drink to that later. Once the lid is loose and clear, I needed to remove the nuts holding the bus bar down so I can add a fuse for my Orion charging circuit. Once the bus bar was free, I simply dropped my new 60 amp MIDI fuse into place. Replace the bus bar and then tighten the nuts that I just took off. And then I added an extra six millimeter stop nut to the fuse that I just added. And then pop the cover back in place. I brought the fuse holder back over to the seat pedestal and put it back in place the same way that I just found it. And then I put my six gauge wire going to the Orion onto the fuse that I just added. And then I added a six millimeter stop nut to the top of that stud to secure the lug to the fuse. Now the Orion is all connected to the OEM start battery charging circuit. Now I simply put everything back in place, literally in the reverse order as it came out. Positive wires to the fuse holder. Fuse block on the side. Relay bar on the top. Nuts for computer magoo. And replace the juice box. Put the seat back into place. Bolt it down. Reattach the cable to the seat, reconnect the battery ground cable, and smack the trap door back into place. And now I can go back to the back and turn the master battery switch on, which allows us to then connect to the Victron Orion via the Victron Connect app, and change the settings to the proper parameters for these batteries, which I'll leave a link to a cheat sheet for those in the video description below. Lastly, I can put the remote wire bridge in place, and then I can turn the engine on. And then after about two to three minutes of the engine running, we can see that the Orion is charging, but if we want to see the charging rate, we should check in on the BMV section of the Victron Connect app, and we should see somewhere around a 30 amp positive charge here. Now, this was actually the last step in this electrical install, and we're finished. But now everything is installed, we're gonna take a step back and recap our various charging sources, how they work together, and discuss the flow of power throughout the system. And that's coming up next, so stay tuned. Now that we've completed the install, it's time to go over the system to understand the flow of power. Now, I'm gonna come off script for this video because we're gonna slow things down just a little bit. I don't wanna come across going too quickly whenever I'm trying to explain all of this stuff. So we're gonna talk about six things in this video. 
we got first one, it's going to be power storage. The next three are going to be the ways we charge the system, which is alternator, uh, short power, and then solar. And then the last two things that we're going to talk about in this video is how we use power. So 120 volt AC power and 12 volt DC power. So let's start with battery storage or power storage, which is the battery bank. So we have six 100 amp hour Battleborn lithium batteries here. And these are all 12 volt batteries and they're wired in parallel into a 600 amp hour battery bank. So these 12 volt batteries, when wired in parallel, the voltages stay the same and while the amperages get added together. So we've got a 12 volt battery bank. Power is coming and oh, and this is how power is being stored. So no matter what method is, uh, is charging the batteries, all the power is getting stored here. So from the battery bank, that's how that's this is where we want to talk about the different ways that we can uh, we can charge the batteries and we're going to start off with solar charging because I think it's the most straightforward. So up on the roof up top we have a 400 watt solar panel and those two wires that are coming from the solar panel are coming down to the solar isolator. Now that solar panel up there um, it's going to be operating at about 40 volts or so. And if you put 40 volts to this battery bank, it's going to do what? It's going to damage it. It's going to be a bad time. So we have to have something in line that takes those 40 volts that might be fluctuating depending on if clouds are covering the solar panels or you know, it's, it's early in the morning and the sun is just barely up or a bird poops on the panel, like whatever that case is, you know, that voltage can fluctuate and it could be high as 40, maybe 50 volts. So we need something in line that's going to take that high and, and variable voltage and convert it down to the 12 volts that it takes to charge the battery bank. So the wires come down through the roof, through the isolator, to the Victron multiple, I'm sorry, to the Victron smart solar charge controller. And this is what's responsible from taking that high voltage and converting it down to the 12 volts we need to charge the battery bank. Now, when I say 12 volts to charge the battery bank, that's a nominal 12 volts. These batteries actually want to charge um, at a max voltage of 14.4. So if I say it's charging at 12 volts, just know that it may not necessarily be charging at 12 volts. It's going to be charging at probably closer to 14.4 volts. So that's the, that's the solar charging leg of this system. The second way we get to charge this system is from alternator charging. So we've got our alternator up front. It's being spun by the engine that's pushing this thing down the road. And that's usually charging at about 14, let's call it 14.2 uh, in this particular vehicle. Now, if you've got an older vehicle that's, uh, you know, the alternator's kind of tired and stuff like that, it may be, um, it may not be putting out even that much voltage. It may be, let's call it 13.7 or something like that. And so if these batteries need to be charging at 14.4 volts, we need something that's going to take that 13.8 volts, 14.2 volts, and boost it up to a level that's more appropriate to charge these up. Because if we're just charging this with 13.8 volts, uh, these are not going to get charged all the way to full. They may get some charge, uh, but they're not going to charge to 100%. So that is what the Orion does, is it takes that power, uh, it takes the voltage from the alternator that's up front, and it converts that to whatever voltage that these batteries need, which we preset that in the Victron Connect app back when we installed this. And that's pretty much what the purpose of this thing is. Something else about this particular Orion is it's rated for 30 amps. That means it's going to pump out 30 amps into this battery bank. Now, a alternator is a mechanical device that essentially has a finite lifetime. An alternator can only put out so many amps over the course of its life. And the faster we use those amps, the sooner it's going to burn out. The harder we push that alternator, the faster it's going to burn out. We're going to have to replace it. So the safest way to charge from the alternator is to not charge from the alternator. Anywhere in any, anything you ask more of your alternator than you know, zero, you're wearing it out. Anytime you're using your alternator, you're wearing it out. So by using the Orion that has a maximum of 30 amp output, that means that this is basically only going to ask for 30 amps from the alternator. So 
This uh, Sprinter's got, I believe, a 220 amp alternator in it. So this is, somebody can do some quick math on that for me, but it's a very low percentage of the maximum rated output of that alternator. So uh, that alternator is gonna have no problem supplying 30 amps to, uh, to this Orion, to this battery bank. So that pretty much completes the, uh, the alternator charging side of things. So the last way that we can charge this system is through the Victron MultiPlus inverter charger. Now the Victron MultiPlus is a inverter and a charger all in one. So the charger function of it, it takes the 120 volt power from the wall outlet or shore power at a campground, and it takes that 120 volt AC power and converts it into 12 volt DC power to charge the battery bank. So wire goes from shore power into the MultiPlus inverter charger. Charger function converts the 120 volt 120 volt AC into 12 volt DC and sends it through these two wires, links distributor, links distributor to the battery bank. So those are the three ways that we can charge the, uh, those are the three ways we can charge this system. So let's talk about the two ways that we can use power. So the most, uh, the easiest way is 12 volt power. It's also the most efficient way because we're not having to do any kind of conversions. So these batteries, 12 volts through these two wires, through the links distributor. And from the links distributor, it's coming out into the 12 volt, uh, the 12 volt fuse block right here. So from the 12 volt fuse block, it's going to all the stuff that's around this camper, these lights here, uh, USB outlets, that's going to be annoying. USB outlets, water pump, refrigerators, 12 volt, um, drawing a blank on the other stuff. But I think most people grasp the concept of what the 12 volt loads around the uh, uh, of what around the uh, the camper van are. So that's the most straightforward way to use power is 12 volt power from the battery bank, links distributor, links distributor to the uh, 12 volt fuse block. So the other way we can use power is 120 volt AC power. Now the 120 volt AC power is going to be stuff like your standard household appliances, you know, blenders, coffee makers, um, most. Computers are plugging into a 120 volt outlet. So even though they're a DC device, anything that is your standard household outlet that you would find in your bedroom or your kitchen, your living room, anything like that, that's 120 volt uh, power. So the Victron MultiPlus is what's responsible for doing that. So we have 12 volt power coming from the battery bank out through the Victron Links distributor and then Victron Links distributor to the MultiPlus. And that's, these wires are at 12 volts and then this is taking the 12 volt DC power and it's converting that to 120 volt AC power and it's sending that to our breaker box right here. Pretty much just the same in, as in your house. You have the breaker box in the wall, you have power coming into that breaker box and then from that breaker box you've got breakers and then from those breakers those are going to your living room, your kitchen, your dining room, all that kind of stuff. So we have five different circuits on here and I would say that's fairly typical for a well set up um, electrical system into, in a camper van. Um, but you can get away with, you know, um, outlets on one side and outlets on the other side for two circuits. But typically I'll be seeing uh, driver side outlets, uh, passenger side outlets, a hot water heater, which that's something that we have here um, that will be hooked up later, um, an air conditioner, so 120 volt air conditioner, like rooftop air conditioner. Um, what else? Usually um, I'll see a specific outlet for um, like a dedicated load. So uh, like a heavy load, so coffee maker or induction cooktop or something like that. So I'm typically seeing five, uh, five different uh, circuits. Now you can have multiple different uh, outlets on one circuit. So best way I like to describe that is think about in your bedroom. All of the outlets around your bedroom are on one circuit usually in pretty much 99% of houses, but you've got, you know, whatever, six or seven different outlets. Um, and that just means that you can pull 20 amps from all of those outlets combined, given it's a 20 amp circuit, circuit, which is pretty common. So you can't pull, you know, all 20 amps from one, 
uh, one outlet that's going to overload the outlet. But you know, you may have five amps uh, on your bedside table and another five amps on the other bedside table, and then you've got a TV running, which is you know two or three amps kind of thing. So you can have different outlets all in the same circuit. But you guys probably know that specifically in a kitchen, if you plug in your blender here and your coffee maker here and your George Foreman grill here, and uh, it's going to pop the breaker for your kitchen, and it's going to you're going to go out to the garage and turn that breaker back on. Now let's continue on talking about AC power real quick and I want to explain what power assist is. I mentioned it in the video where we were wiring up. It was either the multi plus or the 120 volt uh, branch circuits. I don't remember which one. But what, multi -plus, uh, what the multi plus can do is called power assist. And what power assist is, is let's say um, it's early morning and you're cooking breakfast in South Texas and it's already 105 degrees outside. So you're running your air conditioner, uh, you're making some coffee, and you're also running your induction cooktop for some bacon and eggs, right? So you've got those three heavy loads. Air conditioner is at 15 amps for easy figuring. Um, you're plug and you're plugged into shore power at this point. So air conditioner at 15 amps, um, your coffee maker at 15 amps, and your induction cooktop at 15 amps. So what happens if you have those 45 amps connected to just straight up shore power, you know, a 30 amp shore power, which is what this, this camper is set up for. You know, it's gonna trip the breaker out on the power pedestal. You're gonna lose all power, you're gonna to have to go outside and reset it. But what the what Power Assist does from the MultiPlus is you can tell the MultiPlus from the Victron Connect app. You can say, hey MultiPlus, like we're connected to a 30 amp shore power and I want you to pull no more than 30 amps of power from that shore power pedestal so we don't trip that breaker. Anything else needs to come from the battery bank. Battery bank, And so what the MultiPlus will do is it knows that now and it will be monitoring the power that's coming out of it and it'll pull, uh, it'll pull 30 amps from shore power and then whatever else uh, you need. So if, that would theoretically pull you know, 15 amps for your air conditioner, 15 amps for the coffee maker. But then when you need to fire up the induction cooktop for those bacon and eggs, then this is going to be like, whoa, I can't do that from the uh, shore power pedestal. We're just gonna pull that from the battery bank. And so it can add power from the battery bank inverted to 120 volt DC power, I'm sorry, to 120 volt AC power to the, um, to the, the, the breaker box back here to power the air conditioner the coffee maker and bacon and eggs. And this is really important because I do not want to make people choose between air conditioning, coffee, and bacon and eggs. That's just an unfair thing that I have to make people choose for, so I don't wanna do it. So I really like the power assist function of the MultiPlus. Now, hopefully that kind of summarizes what we've been doing for the last basically 10 episodes. Um, you know, we talked about the storage in the battery bank. We talked about how we charge, so um, shore power, uh, alternator power, um, solar. We talked about how we can use 120 volt appliances and 12 volt appliances. So I think that pretty well covers that. So we're gonna wrap this video up. Thanks for watching. And that wraps up this tutorial. Thanks for sticking around. I hope you found this video helpful. And if you did, it'd be awesome if you would share it with somebody or a group who you think could use it. Hit the like button and leave any questions you've got or new things you learned in the comment section below. Subscribe if you want to see more DIY camper building tutorials and I will see you in the next video.